Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm very happy to have Ray Fleming, uh, who's with us today. Uh, he's the Higher Education Director for Microsoft Australia, and we're going to be talking about uh, what it takes for innovation to succeed in a large company like Microsoft. Ray, it's wonderful having you here. Hey, thanks for having me. It's uh, good to chat. So uh, before we get going, could you just give us a quick b- background as to what you do and uh, how that work is a bit related to innovation? Yeah, so I am a a lifelong education technologist, so I've never worked in the education sector. I'm not an ex-teacher or anything, Um, but all of my my life has been in education technology. And in my current role as the higher education director for Australia, um, my real focus is how do you connect the technology to the business purpose and the business process? So we all know that you can do amazing things with technology and we're doing it in our home lives all of the time. Well, how does the latest whizzy technology relate to a business problem that an organization is trying to deal with? We've got, you know, a hundred thousand propeller heads, but it's relating that technology to the business problem. That's my focus in my role in higher education. I work with peers that do that for uh, healthcare, retail, other industry sectors as well. And uh, obviously, we're, we're going to talk about Microsoft a bit today. I've been I've been really keen to speak with you specifically uh, as one of my podcast guests because I've been very impressed with Microsoft as a company over the last five years in the way that they've really changed their success rate when it comes to innovation. Uh, can you give us a bit of background as to what has happened uh, at Microsoft as far as the innovation focus? Yeah, and, and, and it's funny that you say five years because five years is the timeline. Um, and the, I think the, the reason for that is the change of uh, CEO. So Steve Ballmer running Microsoft, you know, incredibly successful organization financially, if you look at the numbers through the period. But what happened when Satya Nadella took over is a cultural change within the organization. So Satya was very, very focused on getting the culture right within the organization and having a sense of purpose to the organization Um, and, and, and shifting away from a product centric revenue centric perspective. And that cultural change has then led to, you know, a complete transformation from a revenue centric point of view. You know, we've gone from an organization that was relevant in some industry sectors. So for example, we are very strong with enterprise, but we weren't, seen as the most innovative company on the block. Whereas I think over the last five years, I've seen the reporting about our innovations has really ramped off, ramped up along with the perceptions of the outside world. Yeah, I, I remember the moment actually when Satya Nadella was announced. Uh, I can't remember exactly which year it was. Was it about 20... It's almost exactly five years ago now. Okay, so 2014. Um, and uh, at the time, people who weren't sort of deep into the industry very few people had heard of this man. Um, so it was, it seemed to be a bit of a, a shocking announcement that someone who'd been at Microsoft for a while, but in the background running there, was it server architecture and yeah. sort of enterprise? Yeah, an engineer. And then a, a deep engineer was taking over from uh, Steve Barmer, who'd been working alongside Bill Gates for, for many decades. Yeah, and and that cultural change that goes with having somebody from engineering running the organization has been you know, fascinating to be a part of on that journey for the last five years. So the, the thing I always think about, and this comes back again and again and again to culture rather than anything else, is um, you know, our identity cards that get, gets us into the building and, and allows us access to all our resources. On the back of it is our company mission. And, and the mission is empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more which sounds like a facile phrase, but, you know, it's something that comes back every day, you know, kind of 
we know that our goal is how do we empower people to achieve more? And, and if you think about technology, technology is great. It's like whizzy flashing lights and all that kind of stuff. But how does it help somebody to solve a problem? If I think about, I don't know, something really geeky like machine learning and, and technology, it's like, how does it help solve a business problem? In education, how does it help a student achieve more? And through that, you're improving life chances for your, for your customers. And I suppose that that culture that is that is our job comes through in the messaging to us as employees all of the time. Uh, yeah, I, I remember many years ago, uh, Microsoft always seemed to come out with these press releases of, of new research-driven technology uh, that were that seemed to be just light years uh, ahead of other companies' efforts, like the Connect 3D scanning, uh, the instant translation services over Skype, uh, and yet. Uh, for the last sort of 10 years, that hadn't really translated into a company that was succeeding at innovation overall. Uh, when you talk to the industry analysts, they were saying, oh, Microsoft, they've missed the boat on mobile phones, and they've missed the boat on web apps, and they've, they've, they've basically been overtaken by the Googles and the Facebooks and the Apples, and they're a company from the 80s and the 90s. I think that one of the reflections of the change that enables us to act differently is um, if you read uh, Satch's book, he talks about the organization moving from an organization of know-it-alls to an organization of learn-it-alls. So instead of having all the answers, being genuinely inquisitive, both internally and externally. And, you know, that's then reflected back into things like in the past, we wouldn't move until we knew all of the answers to all of the questions. Um, whereas now, we may not necessarily know the answers to the questions and we certainly don't want to take the attitude that we do know the answers and therefore we're learning as we're moving, but it allows you to move more rapidly because you accept that you might make mistakes along the way. And as long as you can fix those mistakes as you move and also regard them as, as learning points. I mean, I, I look back on, on my life and career and my goodness, you know, all the biggest lessons I've learned have been learned from mistakes. And I'm the kind of person that remembers exactly what was said in a particular situation that was, you know, a mistake. And, and those things are the things I've learned from. And I think as an organization, we'd got into a fault intolerant way of working, which was let's minimize risk. Let's be sure of everything before you make a decision. Well, that's fine, but you can't move fast at the same time as doing that. So that message of becoming learn it alls rather than know it alls and being accepting of learning through failure has been really important in that cultural change. Absolutely. You, you hear about the, the ethos of uh, Silicon Valley and, and technology companies being, as Mark Zuckerberg says, uh, move fast and break things. And you expect that all technology companies are going to be like that. But uh, is it is it true to say that Microsoft had changed cultural direction or um, what, what can you elaborate a bit on uh, what was happening before Satya took over? Yeah. So, um, you know, when you're a big enterprise IT supplier, you can't afford to move fast and break things. You know, if I, if I make a change on a consumer application, that means that the filters don't work on your favorite image application, it's, not a disaster, you kind of fix it and move on. But if you've got somebody like a bank or a airline or a supermarket that is running their business through digital, you can't afford for anything to go wrong. And so that move fast and break things attitude doesn't work. So you have to re-engineer the way that you do things in order to allow yourself to be more agile and more responsive at the same time as not uh, breaking people's business models. I think... Um, was it two weeks ago we had another outage with an airline where nobody could check in, nobody could buy tickets from their website. And, you know, in those scenarios, you're losing hundreds of millions of dollars an hour. So you've got to take the risk out of live situations like that, but then also allow yourself to be innovative. So if we look at the way that our products have changed, you know, we used to do products on every, I don't know, what, a four year release cycle, there'd be office, 2010, then Office 2013, then Office 2016, there's Windows, you know, XP, Vista, 7, 8, etc. And they were big cycle releases. But what we've had to do is change the way we think about product iteration to allow us to iterate on a much faster basis 
But then as a result, you have to change the way you test. You have to change the way that you trial things. Um, rather than having a big release every four years, you might have a release every month, but it only goes out to a small subset of users. And by that, you might have a million testers or 10 million testers rather than internally people testing the product and then releasing it in a big release to a customer. You might release a beta to a million home users to see what uh, issues there are in it and to give them access to early technology, but from a business point of view, allow you to test. And I mean, one of the other things that I've seen, uh, you, you, you do change the way you test products, uh, but Microsoft also seems to have completely changed their, their focus of, I'm not going to say ownership of the platform, but uh, Microsoft in the, the 2000s, uh, they, they were trying to control uh, Office runs on this system, Internet Explorer works on this system, and try and sort of keep Apple at bay and keep Google at bay. Whereas nowadays, uh, uh, it, would, it would seem to be a running joke that uh, Microsoft hated open source and hated Linux. And nowadays, they uh, they run Linux. They uh, they have GitHub, which is one of the largest open source platforms there is, uh, and you can get Microsoft Office on more or less any hardware device you can think about. Yeah, and if I think about that from the perspective of a customer, it's reflective of what they need, which is, you know, you're never going to put all of your technology into one sing single piece of technology from one single supply. You can't run a bank like that. You can't run a university like that. You can't run a school like that. And so those partnerships that are designed to put different bits of technology together in a, in a successful solution that a customer can use becomes really important because you know i deal with universities all the time you don't have to sit in the university long before somebody asks the question of is this available on linux you know this might be the best application in the world but unless it's available to run it on the linux desktop i'm using it's no good to me and so I think the first way that people would have seen that would have been as consumers seeing Microsoft applications coming to the iPhone and the iPad. In fact, I think the announcement of Office for the iPad was one of the first major product announcements after Satya took over. Up until that point, there was, there was very little. Um, but now you're right, we're kind of into embracing open source. We're one of the biggest runners of open source in our technology. Um, you know, our cloud is you know, used by tens of thousands, if not millions of people running open source on it. So you, you do that in order to give the customer what they want. But it's also part of the cultural change within the organization, which is, you know, if you're going to help people achieve what they want to do, you've got to help them by delivering the technology that's interoperable to do that. And I think cultural change is one of the, the main things I'd like to sort of get your thoughts on now, both within Microsoft and maybe within the, the partners you work with. Uh, it, it's, it's easy enough to put a, a vision or purpose statement on the back of everyone's ID cards, but what did it actually take for that to embed within the organization? I think there are a couple of things. One is that genuine curiosity. So our industry is changing really fast, but the speed of change in technology is also now being reflected in other businesses because most businesses have got a, a digital aspect of their business. So that pace of change for us is now impacting other people. So how do you continually learn? So we've had to become a learning organization, but as individuals, we've had to become continuous learners. Well, that's going to affect every economy in the world. Um, and that's a challenge because the education system is set up for starting education at five finishing at roughly 21, 22 with a, a certificate and a celebration, and then you're kind of on your own. But what's going to happen going forward is that people are going to have to continually re-educate themselves, either individually or with organizations or the education system. So, you know, there's a clear expectation on us within Microsoft to be continuing, continually learning, finding the time for learning, making our own time for learning, the organization making our time for learning, but and setting milestones for us. So if I think about that change and the, uh, the agility that goes with continually learning and, and um, changing as you go, and I think about my customers in universities, you know, their traditional product or service is a four-year degree or a three-year degree, which is come here, learn, celebrate leaving. And then if you're lucky, 
the university will get you back to do a master's for another two years. Well, that's not the product that's needed for the future because people are going to have to be genuinely become lifelong learners and they're not going to be able to suspend their career while they go to learn. So that part about becoming continual learners is one aspect of the cultural change. And, and that's an organization wide thing. This, the second is about that taking risks, learning from mistakes. And as long as the value of what you learn is worth more than the cost of mistake, then that's a good thing. Um, and then the third thing is a mindset around data led decision making. You know, as an organization, we have huge amounts of data, but we weren't necessarily using it in order to make the right decisions. Whether that's a simple decision like where do you put your Salesforce effort or which product feature you develop next, or whether it's big stuff like are our customers net promoters of our products and are changes we're making moving them in the right direction or not. So that data-led decision-making piece has been really important. We have this concept of the hippo. The, uh, and, and I know we're not the only organization to have this. MIT have talked about this before. The hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. And we've all been in those meetings, haven't we? When somebody comes in, they're the most senior, and they said, well, I just spoke to customer X. And customer X said they hate this feature, so go fix it. Sure. Um, and... You know, changing that around to say, well, here's the data, here's what we're hearing all of the time, here's the things that people say are most important. So you're not basing your decisions on opinions, but you're making your decisions based on data. Where does the the balance with data led decision making fit, though, uh, between having data available for something which has been released, uh, so an existing product, and then being able to figure out what needs to be innovated next. A lot of companies really struggle with uh, trying to get new ideas past the first boundary because there's not any data to support them yet. Yeah, do you, do you know, um, let's talk about Yammer, and I'm pretty sure this has been publicly documented. In fact, I know this has been publicly documented. So. When Yammer joined Microsoft, part of the value for Microsoft was learning about how you do this iterative process. So what they tend to do is they, they will work on very short sprints on product features. And those product features will be released to a small subset of users. Let's say they release it to 100,000 people. Um, and then they'll watch how those features are used and whether they are impacting the, me the metrics that they might be looking at. So for example, they've got a feature that's around engagement with the platform. If you release it to 100,000 uh, 100, people, do you see overnight in 24 hours an uptick in engagement? And if you do, you carry on to the next stage, which maybe is test it on a million people or 10 million people before eventually you release it to everybody. But because you're only working on that project for maybe two weeks before you release that feature, you've got a very quick cycle of a feedback loop that tells you, we think this will help our users. And the data tells us after two weeks and then another two weeks that it is making a difference. And so taking that mindset and applying it to other things that you do as an organization, you know, again, I work with universities. How do you, how do you innovate that mindset into a product or a course that is a four-year course that maybe has taken you two years to develop um, yeah. because you've got all the regulation around making sure it meets the standards. So you you can make some changes there. So I know of, um, you know, one example is a course in three-dimensional construction. You know, today the construction industry pretty much you can produce a great 3D building, but you have to turn it into 2D plans for the brickie to lay your walls for you. So how do you go from 3D and stay in 3D to the construction phase. Nobody knows what that industry is going to look like, but there's some early technology like some work we're doing with HoloLens that will help you get there. And so what they've done in that course is say, we know the future is 3D construction. So what we're gonna do is make every student a researcher and what they're gonna be doing is researching the ways things will happen in the future. And what came out of that was a group of students that are able to work in a new way that are looking at the future of their own industry, but also they've productized a couple of um, design ideas that came out of that in order to be able to actually influence the future of the industry. And that's very different from the old academic model of, we'll write a course, we'll get it through all the committees, two years later we'll start delivering it, 
and four years later the first graduate will come out you know, I by think, which point who knows whether it's still relevant six years later yeah we're, we're a hundred thousand data scientists short in australia probably in three or four years time we'll be three hundred thousand short if you start developing a course today for modern data science your first graduate will come out in six years time when we're probably you know half a million short plus they'll probably have the wrong skills I learned data science, uh, one aspect of data science, machine learning stuff on a, a course 18 months ago, 80% of it has now been replaced with automated technology. So, you know, it's out of date and that's only 18 months ago. I mean, it, it's something that, that all companies are gonna have to uh, adjust to thinking about what, what is the future gonna look like and, and how do we build the, the skills and the mindset to get there. And um, that, I, yeah. well, that comes back to culture. You've got Absolutely. to have that inquisitive culture. So let's leave with a parting thought then. If you had one piece of advice on helping uh, how companies can help build that culture and that mindset, uh, what do you think works quite well? I think start from the top. Talk about learning. Talk about the books you're reading. Talk about the things you don't know because it's as much recognizing you don't know things as you do know. Don't be that know-it-all expert, but demonstrate to other people that you're inquisitive at learning. And that has to go from the top of the organization and every manager within that organization um, to then in, in, in fact, in a viral way, the rest of your organization to become curious and want to become learners. Fascinating. Ray, it's been wonderful having you here. Um, if people want to find out a bit more about your work, what's the best way they can go about doing that? Oh, LinkedIn is the obvious answer because, uh, you know, that I'll, I'll be putting there the things that are happening this week and next week and the week after. So, yeah, look me up, Ray Fleming, on LinkedIn, and uh, that's where you'll find what, what I'm thinking about any week. Perfect. I'll make sure to get that link in the description below. Ray, it's been wonderful having you here, and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share, and subscribe, and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.